It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Welcome back and thank you for listening to the podcast. I have some courses coming up that you might be interested in First West Virginia as well as a two-day course in New York. First day is regenerative medicine, regenerative pain medicine. Second day is ultrasound, Saturday, Sunday, May 4th and 5th. Then an ultrasound course as I, that I recently added to the website in January, excuse me, in June, getting my J's mixed up, the 29th and August 3rd on Saturdays. We're doing an ultrasound course in New York. And I'll be at ASIP Aspen. I'm teaching at Aspen, actually. Uh, so I'll be faculty there. So if you sign up for that ultrasound course, you'll see me. And um, I'm actually going to Washington, D.C. next week to meet with congressmen on independent review organizations sponsored by Sprint. Um, we're not going there to, to talk about Sprint or to push their agenda. We're going there to shed some light on how things operate with respect to the insurance companies using third parties to say whether or not our evidence-based therapies are deemed worthy. Um, so it should be quite interesting. Um, I'm oversimplifying it, but um, I think you guys, those of you who are already in practice should understand what I'm talking about. And this is when you have to call a third party to justify your management of a patient and then they have their guidelines, and then they'll reject something, tell you it's not evidence-based, when there's usually plenty of evidence to support what you're doing. Anyway, it, it is board prep season, and I, if you didn't know, you probably do, but I took my pain exam, pain management board review, I put it on the NRAP website, as well as my anesthesia, PMNR, and APP pain reviews. All of them are on the NRAP website. You can get there through painexam.com or anesthesiaexam.com. I'm in the process of making an app for the painexam.com finally. Um, and so just check out the website. If you're a little confused about the, um, if you're studying for the pain boards, pain exam, basic subscription should be enough. However, if you want the whole package, the virtual pain fellowship, it includes the ultrasound course for TMJ, the ultrasound pain interventional uh, course, which is on demand and it's comprehensive head to toe nerve block spine etc the regenerative medicine course on demand as well so there's a lot rolled into that and it's about 48 49 cme credits so be sure to check that out it's probably the most uh, cost effective way to study for the boards and prepare for your career as a pain physician the anesthesia review also is great it has the ultrasound guided course rolled into it so it's included so be sure to check out nrappain.org or anesthesiaexam.com or painexam.com anyway so this podcast was actually inspired by one of my students last weekend at an ultrasound course I ran in New York City and this was a real good guy a psychiatrist coming from Texas he works with an inter interventional pain group and he mentioned the term interventional psychiatry, which I heard of. It's not really new. And you can imagine what's interventional psychiatry, ECT, ketamine infusions, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and vagal nerve stimulation, which um, can be used for various purposes uh, for depression, bipolar disorders. And he came for to learn a stellate ganglion block at my course. Um, and the first thing I said, well, do you have any experience with ultrasound? And he said, no. So just a word of advice, if you're not aware, I'm, I'm, I imagine you could probably see where this is going. If you want to do a stalate ganglion block and you're coming from nowhere, don't do it. It's, it's, it's really um, going from zero to 100 or running before you can crawl. 
stellate ganglion blocks are one of the most high-risk ultrasound procedures that we're doing. The ultrasound definitely reduced the risk. However, you're putting a needle behind the carotid artery, and there's all sorts of other blood vessels in the neck. The vertebral artery, the veins of the neck, the jugular veins, smaller veins, and almost on cue, the sirens are in the background. I don't know if you hear that, but anyway, a lot can go wrong, right? And you don't want to call EMS to your office when you're doing a procedure to help them with the pain. In fact, I usually do this procedure in an ASC, or at least um, my office is now quad A, so I, I have all the equipment to do it here. But this is something you need to be prepared for seizure, loss of consciousness, stroke, almost anything that can happen if you inject local anesthetic with or without steroid into a blood vessel in the neck. We scanned the model's neck when we were demonstrating the placement, and the, um, the, this model actually had a lot of vasculature over longus coli where the stellate ganglion is, which I've actually never seen. And it was an artifact. It was kind of strange. Um, so I think that made the student think twice about doing the procedure because it, it, it did look a little terrifying, almost like a minefield. Um, so whenever I teach a course... My courses are really meant for people who do interventional pain injections, whether you're an anesthesiologist, pain physician, physiatrist, ER doctor, and you could be a PA or an NP, but what I do at the beginning of my courses is to address scope of practice, which is a big thing. Certain people should not be doing certain things. Now, those lines have been blurred across over the years. Um, you come to a weekend ultrasound course, you want to do a knee injection on the ultrasound, whether you're an internist or a pain physician, I don't think it's a big deal. That's my personal opinion. However, when you start talking about more invasive procedures such as epidural, stellate, ganglion blocks, a weekend course is not going to cut it. You need to have a chaperone with you while you do these procedures. And that's something that um, I've, uh, I, I, I really, you know, Pain doctors are doing neurosurgical procedures now. So scope of practice is really something that um, is quite blurry, and I think local state boards will vary on the degree. I know some PAs in some states can start their own pain practice. And, um, you know, I understand access to health care. Maybe it's, that's the reason for it because there's not enough doctors. I understand that. However, at the same time, um, Training is a big deal, and having the full experience of doing a residency internship and then ha being chaperoned while doing these procedures and then having some independence and doing a ton of them is really um, paramount to being able to safely handle any case that comes into your office or your facility and getting through it safely. Um, so my, 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 my point is, you know, just be very careful with, with, with what you do. Um, I've been called to consult uh, or to coach physicians in their own practices while they do the procedures on their own patients, and I walk them through it, or I'm just there for, the, I guess, the emotional support so they know that there's someone there who can guide and direct. It's something that I think um, is really important to do. Don't just go to a weekend course and start doing things unless you're really prepared to handle the, compl the complications or the difficulties that may occur. That being said, um, I, I meant to talk today about the interventional psychiatry, and I'm really going to just briefly touch on this because it's a big field, and I really should interview um, the student on the podcast. The problem is I podcast at like 6 a.m., so it's kind of hard to get people at that time. Anyway, um, in terms of the stellate ganglion block, I, 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 in the world of psych, post-traumatic stress disorder, here's a randomized controlled double-blind trial, which really is not very impressive. Here they're mentioning in their conclusion that previous case series suggested that the stellate ganglion block offers effective intervention for PTSD. The study did not demonstrate any appreciable differences between the stellate ganglion group and the sham treatment or on psychological or pain outcomes. Further studies should be done, and so they're saying the current evidence does not support widespread or indiscriminate clinical use of the procedure for post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's something to take into account. I've offered this procedure typically to patients who've had pain with post-traumatic stress disorder together because I was, I guess, maybe concerned more. Well, first of all, I'm a pain doctor, not a psychiatrist. So, secondly, um, 
it, I was looking for that combination of patient. So I guess maybe I wouldn't have to deal with any problems with the reimbursement or coverage. And I, I, they definitely reported improvement in their PTSD symptoms. And anecdotally, I'd say it lasted probably two to three months. So, you know, I guess the jury is still out with this therapy. Um, the other therapy I, I really wanted to touch on was um, ketamine. Ketamine has been, you know, a big deal now. And, um, I mean, a lot of us are doing IV ketamine infusions for pain, <clears throat> now depression. I found um, one study on subcutaneous ketamine, which I just thought was interesting, systemic review, systematic review, excuse me. And there's they basically um, identified 159 potentially relevant articles. Twelve were selected for applying for inclusion-exclusion criteria comp- uh, with two randomized controlled trials, five case reports, and five retrospective studies. There was a small number of studies found, um, and so that the meta-analysis was not considered appropriate. Um, but here they're mentioning what they did find, and they said that subcutaneous racemic ketamine and ES ketamine in depression is a promising strategy showing beneficial efficacy and tolerability. Future studies need to be done. Um, and so that's one option. Here's another study with oral ketamine saying a small number of clinical studies assess the antidepressant effect of oral ketamine. Initial results suggest that oral ketamine has significant antidepressant effects with good overall tolerability. However, antidepressant effects are not as rapid as those associated with IV ketamine. Anti-suicide effects and efficacy in treatment-resistant depression have yet to be demonstrated, so they need more randomized controlled trials. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the data because most of the articles are saying we need more data. That's pretty classic about these types of things these days. So that being said, a lot of us are still doing uh, ketamine infusions in our clinics. I'm I'm seeing ketamine clinics pop up left and right. And um, in fact, I have a family member who's dealing with depression right now, and I'm considering referring them for ketamine. So I, I, you know, if the conventional stuff is not working, you need to start thinking outside the box. I, I don't even think ketamine so far outside the box these days. But if you use it appropriately, and you're covering, um, and you're cautious about psychological, psych- psychiatric effects, um, then, then it, it may be quite helpful. Now, just to uh, rewind to last weekend with a psychiatrist who attended my event, he did mention using magnesium as a cofactor with ketamine, and um, stating that multiple studies have observed a relationship between depression and magnesium levels. Studies indicate antidepressive properties of magnesium, its potential usage as an additive substance to antidepressive treatment. Magnesium ions contribute to neurotransmission, in particular glutaminergic transmission, and several reports indicate the possible role of magnesium imbalance in the pathophysiology of mood disorders. There's no direct relationship found with magnesium levels associated with a chronic and treatment-resistant course of depression, but it's been hypothesized that the synergistic effects in the pharmacodynamics of magnesium and ketamine in the treatment of depression impacts the antidepressive effects of ketamine infusions in patients with mood disorders. So he doesn't add magnesium to everyone, but I believe... Um, it's, indica- it's being used in patients who maybe need that little bump up if they're not really getting the effects that are needed. Um, here they're saying that in um, preclinical studies, magnesium administered with low-dose NDMA antagonists cause a, reductive, a reduction in, move- in depressive-like behavior during animal depression modelings, uh, the four swim test in, in mice, and um, one animal study hypothesized about magnesium potentially being a cofactor, which we mentioned earlier. So anyway... Um, they're talking about using magnesium with other antidepressants here. If you're really interested in it, check it out on the show notes. I'll have the link here. And um, I just wanted to keep this podcast brief and short. But, I mean, I think it's nice that psychiatry is really evolving. I just think that, um, like everything, we all need to be very careful about what we're doing. And before we jump on the latest trend in medicine, we need to think. I I, I just can tell you anecdotally, I don't know, it's been 10 years or so, I went to a course for regenerative medicine, maybe longer, and the first thing I was thinking was, was is this, is this you know, nonsense, is this real? And my, my initial delve into the world of regenerative medicine was a last resort, was like, I, I, you know, this is, um, you failed everything, this, it's going to cost you money, insurance won't cover it, 
And it went from being my last line therapy to one of my first line therapies. After I realized that my, my treatment resistant patients, some of them were, were responding remarkably, even cured from just one PRP shot after failing the, the nerve blocks, the facets, the, the, the epidurals, this and that. So I am a believer in regenerative medicine, but like every other tool we have, it is no one size fit all. It doesn't mean that every patient needs a regenerative medicine procedure or ketamine or this or that for their pain or, 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 or psychiatric problems. It's usually uh, multiple factors. So that being said, I'm going to leave you on that note. Come see me in New York or wherever the hell I'm going to be. Um, I will be, uh, additionally, if I tell you, I'm going to Mexico City for a conference in August. Uh, if you're interested, the link is on my website. I believe it's part of the IASP, and it's the Congress on Palliative Care and Pain Medicine in Mexico. And I've never been to Mexico City. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm speaking there. It's fac I'm faculty, and I'm going to be talking about ultrasound-guided injections as well as... Um, Possibly regenerative medicine or PNS. I'm not sure yet, um, but it's a little far away. But either way, um, come come to these conferences. The conferences are great. I'll see you at ASIP if you're going to be there. Stop by the pain exam booth. And um, be sure to share the podcast or review it if you like it. If you don't, if you don't like it, don't review it. <laughs> Just tell me what we could do to improve. And um, come to nrappain.org for board prep of the various specialties I mentioned earlier, or ultrasound training, regenerative medicine training, um, or just to learn for free. We have a lot of free resources on the website. So thanks for listening. Hope you have a great day. And take care. Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate, and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.